All the prophecies in the book of Revelation were totally fulfilled at the fall of Rome. Finished. Round about 396 AD. Ended. There it has been a terrible darkness filling this earth from the time of the Garden of Eden. And specifically after the centuries went by from there on. Jesus Christ came and it was recorded in Isaiah to them who sit in the darkness uh, uh, and of the shadow of death light has come. The darkness that was in the world during the Roman Empire was absolutely terrible and heinous. There has been no darkness as such since then, since the fall of Rome until this time. But there's been continuing darkness all the time. Now the possibility is there will be a repeat, and I believe there will be, of the kind of darkness that was in the Roman Empire that is described throughout the whole of the book of Revelation with the consequent judgments. Because at the end, just before the devil is thrown into the lake of fire, something happens. And the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are attacked in a way that has never occurred. Now the prophets of the Old Testament were attacked and killed and martyred, shut in prison. Isaiah was torn in two, cut in two. And the Hebrew, Hebrews 11 tells us about the martyrdoms that went on. We know of the martyrdoms that occurred in the book of Acts. We read about the martyrdoms that would occur in the book of Revelation. And if you read history, you'll see the terrific martyrdoms that were poured out by the evil Romans and indeed the Jews uh, and indeed those who were called Jews today. They were not called Jews then, so I don't know what to call them. The Judeans, they were the Judeans because they belonged to the tribe, they literally belonged to the, tri belonged to the tribe of Judea, tribe of Judah, in Judea, whether they were descendants of Abraham through Jacob or descendants of Abraham through Esau, the Edomites. Because at that time, Edomites filled Judea and they had been brought there by Hyrcanus John who uh, so worked on them that they became followers of the then Judaism that existed. So when Jesus was there, Judah had a majority, I would say, of Edomites because not many Judahites had returned from captivity. But there you have in Judea, Judahites and the Edomites, all called Judeans. All because they all lived there. And so the Edomites were part of Israel at that time. The book of Revelation has shown the vengeance of God upon his people of the Old Testament. Jerusalem fell. And it also shows the vengeance of God upon the people through whom he caused his people to be judged and disappear. And that was to comply with Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. His people were the desolated desolated by Christ. He said those words before his crucifixion. Your house is left unto you desolate. The desolators were the Romans. So 
God judged the desolate. He had de deserted them. He had left them. He had turned his back on them because they turned his back, their back on him. And then the judgment of God on Rome. Now that's what the book of Revelation basically is all about. You see, the history of Israel began in the book of Genesis. It continues until the end of the book of Malachi. All about the history of Israel. It's all about Israel. The history of Israel and Israel itself continues in the book of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and continues somewhat in the epistles, just a little. But also in the Gospels and to a minor degree because there were some Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. There was a Cyrenesian woman with a sick child. There was the woman of Samaria who were kind of Gentiles. Now the Gentiles were the idolaters and the magic workers. That's what Gentile means. Because the whole world was full of paganism. That's why Satan had to be shut up for a thousand years to get rid of the paganism so that the gospel could get around. And then we need to notice that there has been a transformation from God as to who his people are. His people of the Old Testament, the nation, the natural descendants of Abraham are judged. They come to an end. Then there is a new nation, a spiritual one, the children of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. They both have the same name, these two classes of people, Israel. Why the same name? Well, for one thing, because they're descendants of Abraham. For it, to show the election of God. Romans 9 to 11 shows the election of God. He elected not to have Esau. He elected to have Jacob. And then another thing we notice about the book of Revelation is that by the end of chapter 19, his vengeance ends. So chapter 20 is a new subject. Totally different and alien from the former chapters. See, God is revealing a certain truth and glorious end for the old Israel. Because now the people of God is to include, and indeed the majority of them will be, from the Gentiles. Because the new Israel of God is not a theocracy. Now the theocracy of old Israel in the Old Testament was of God's creation. He formed them as his people. But now his new Israel is not a theocracy. It's not a natural nation. It's a spiritual nation. And it's an assembly of called out ones from the world of darkness, from the world of sin, that is coming all the time under judgment from God. Continually, the judgments of God are in all the earth from day one right till the very last day. The judgments of God are continually in the earth. Now this world has been and still is under Satan. Under the fallen angels who were born to the women who gave birth to giants, the Nephilim, the Eljo, and as spirits they became. We are the called out ecclesia, the called out ones. We call it the church. It really means the called out ones. A church is too denominational. <laughs> called out ones is a better term because that's what it really means in the Greek. And so, who are we? We're under Christ. He's our king. 
And our life on earth in this world is not one like the rest of the world. Because we are weak walking in this world as those who are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our walk. We're seated up there. We're to walk like that. So being seated up there, we're in Christ. And we walk by his spirit with the fruits of his spirit of holiness, of joy and peace and long sufferings and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. And also we are walking by the power of the Holy Ghost if we are filled with the Holy Ghost. So being already citizens of heaven, we do not need earthly prophecies. We do not need earthly prophecies about the end time. Indeed, we are, have not been given any earthly prophecies about the end time. All the prophecies of the Old Testament about Israel and Judah were totally fulfilled. Everyone about Gog and Magog, naturally. About Ezekiel's temple. About all the nations you can think of that are mentioned in the Old Testament, all fulfilled. Totally fulfilled. So they don't relate to the church. All the prophecies in the book of Revelation were totally fulfilled at the fall of Rome. Finished. Round about 396 AD. Ended. Where are the prophecies for the church? They do not exist. And we have just discussed the reasons God would not be giving them to us. We're a heavenly people. See, we have a heavenly status, not an earthly status. Now on earth we are citizens of our country, loyal to our country, patriotic as far as possible, obedient as far as possible, obeying the laws of the land as far as possible, and as far as possible means as would be allowed by the Lord Christ according to the words of the, the, of the gospel and the words of, of God himself. Now the Bible does tell us whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So it doesn't matter whether we live or die really in the final analysis, we're the Lord's. We're under his wings while we're alive. We're closer under his wings while we're dead. We're up there, right next to his wings. Down here, it's just something of the spirit. Up there, there's a, a greater reality. We are one spirit with him, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones, Ephesians 5.30. So we belong to Christ. He's not of this earth. He's the husband, and we are the bride. He does not need prophecies, so neither do we. If the husband doesn't need it, neither do we. In our case, the husband gives the prophecies. As the bride, we just submit enough to the fact he has not given us prophecies about the end time because they're not there in the whole Bible. Now, there are indications in some of the last books of the Bible as to terrible things that are going to happen, but the terrible things are ongoing. They're not specifically particularized not like you find in the book of Revelation. And it also says in 1 Corinthians 3.22, whether the presence or the, or the future all belong to you. The present belongs to us, the future belongs to us. Do we need a prophecy to know what's going to happen tomorrow? 
Today belongs to us, tomorrow belongs to us. The end of the world time belongs to us. It belongs to us, so why do we need a prophecy about it? We just rest in this assurance, it belongs to me. I don't need a prophecy. Because it then says, because you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 to 10, Satan has been on a great chain. He's seized by the dragon, who's the serpent, the devil, and Satan, and for a thousand years put in the pit that's locked and sealed, but he's able to kind of get out. He's held by a chain that can get out. He's still around because the Bible tells us in Peter that the Satan, as a roaring lion, walks around whereby he may tempt us. So he's there all the time during that thousand years because we happen to be in that thousand years, which is an indeterminate time. It started then when this spiritual occurrence occurred, took place and it has been ongoing ever since. A thousand years is not literally a thousand years. It's an indeterminate amount of time. So then he can't deceive the world in relation to the way he wa the world was deceived at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire or at the time preceding or during the time of the Babylonian or the Medo-Persian or the Grecian empires. The, the world is not deceived like that. And in particular, around the time of the Roman Empire, in which was congregated all the evils and paganism of Babylon, Medo-Persians, uh, the Greeks, and of course the Romans added their own. We get that in, the, in one of the visions that occurs about the middle of the book of Revelation. So in God's time, the devil would be released. And he's only out for a little while. And this was all to happen further to everything that has already been told us up to the end of chapter 19. This is kind of an addition. Now notice it's further to all the other heavenly visions. And obviously the fulfillment would transpire at the end of the world, if you could do your arithmetic. The end of chapter 19 plus a thousand years, which is indeterminate then the end of the world at the end, towards the end of the chapter. Very clear if you read it. So there's judgment going on during those thousand years because the, as we have learned, the martyrs and the believers are living with Christ for a thousand years and they're reigning up in heaven, doing some judgment about which we are, are not told. They are priests in heaven. So God's time is unknown. Now let us consider this. Satan comes out. He's released. He comes out to deceive the nations. You'll find this in chapter 20. In verse 4, everything there comes to an end. At the end of the thousand years. Because after that, the rest of the dead then come to life. And we know that that really is the resurrection day. So it's at the finale of the end of the world. But this other thing from verses 7 to 10 occurs at the end of the thousand years before the finale of the end of the world. Just a short period. Now, in Earth's time, nobody would know those breaks and halts. You understand what I'm saying? So, Satan then comes out, as it tells us. 
He's released from his prison in verse 7. He comes out to deceive the nations, plural, at the four corners of the earth, plural. Now with the Roman Empire, the, na the nations were, were at the ends of the earth were not included in the Roman Empire as extensive as it was. So this is something different from the Roman Empire. It, it covers the whole earth, all the nations of the earth. All the people in the earth are involved and specifically the people of God. Then it says, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. So what is Gog and Magog? If we look at it closely, we'll see that Satan does the deceiving. Gog and Magog does not do the deceiving. Satan does the attack. Gog and Magog are not on the attack because the deceiver is on the attack. Gog and Magog are not the attacker and neither are they the deceiver. So what is it? They're obviously a class of people, not a nation. Gog and Magog, as recorded in Ezekiel, I think it's 38, was decidedly fulfilled in history. If you read the history, and we have done that study. Decidedly fulfilled. So these people, Gog and Magog, it's a symbol. It's a symbol. They surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Well, who's the beloved city? The saints are already have come to the heavenly city, to Mount Zion, to the city of God, to the new Jerusalem. Hebrews chapter 12, about verses 29 and 30. That's the beloved city. There is no natural beloved city. This is a spiritual beloved city. And so these people, Gog and Magog, as representative of something very evil, is coming against the camp of the believers. And their main purpose is to encompass the whole of the, all the believers, to besiege, this, to besiege them, shut them in. And now at that point where the camp is surrounded by visible enemies, and you might wonder why Gog and Magog is used. Well, Gog and Magog were an enemy of the people of God. So what does the sign Gog and Magog mean? Those who are the enemy of the people of God, a specific class of people. That's Gog and Magog. And so, while the camp is surrounded, because Satan is at the back of it, Satan. Who comprises Satan? We leave that to another time. As the bride, we just submit enough to the fact he has not given us prophecies about the end time because they're not there in the whole Bible. 